Well, hello, the work I'm going to present here is part of my doctoral research. Um, okay, I think that I don't need to introduce Terna Spandau, so let's skip this slide. So what I want to stress is that Terna Spandau presented a wide range of body sizes, ranging from the huge mastodonsaurus, the huge mastodonsaurus with about 6 meters length, to the tiny lodosaurus with only 6 centimeters length. Something important is that almost all small forms of Ternaspondons are within the clade of Dysorophoids. And within Dysorophoids, we, we also find a wide range of, sorry, <laughs> here, a wide range of body sizes. Um, so we have here in these yellow circles the relative skull sizes of the discerning species of these orophoids, and we can see here the largest one, which is a caloma of about 17 cm length, in comparison to the tiny dollar serpenton with a skull of less of 2 cm. And these orophoids are also very important because the, these amphibians are supposed to be originated within this clade. Now, within these orophoids, the smallest forms are also formed in a clade, the clade of amphibamids. And amphibamids has been described both as pedomorphic and also as miniaturized species. And both pedomorphosis and miniaturization were um, proposed as key factors for the evolution of the clay of amphibamids and also for the origin of these amphibians. So the study of both patterns is quite relevant, well, it, at least I think it's very interesting. So what do I mean by pedomorphosis? Well, pedomorphosis is the morphological pattern where, where the adults of a species retain the juvenile, st uh, juvenile traits of the ancestor. And pedomorphosis is the outcome of mechanisms that lead to ontogenetic truncation. And what about miniaturization? Well, miniaturization is the evolution of the extremely small adult size in a lineage. And of course, as you can imagine, it involves changes in ecology, in behavior, in physiology, and of course in morphology, in the way that uh, miniaturized species are not dwarf versions of larger relatives. And what about the critical size to differentiate miniaturization from other less extreme size reduction? Well, it's difficult to establish because first, biological parameters scale differently with body size, and secondly, because physical size is not the same as biological size, because biological size takes into account the cell size. Now, something that is relevant and very interesting is that it has been repeatedly observed that miniaturized tetrapods tend to have novel morphologies. And these novel morphologies are explained because of the extrapolation of the conservative allometry of the clades to a very tiny size, together with new constraints to maintain functional efficiency, such as feeding, such as hearing, etc., etc. And particularly in tetrapods has been also observed that small miniaturized species tend to have huge brain cases and huge otic capsules because of these um, functional constraints. Uh, and I think that a good example is here. We have the skull of a tiny salamander of the genus Taurus, one of the smallest tetrapods on Earth. And we can see this pattern very clearly. Huge brain cases, huge otic capsules, also huge eyes in comparison to the relatively, uh, to the relative, sorry, to the relatively larger uh, related species. Now, these morphological changes are not uh, restricted to the brain case and arctic capsules, but the whole skull suffers uh, structural modifications as the result of this enlargement. So it is typical from small salamanders and from uh, small frogs as well that, for example, the just suspensorium typically um, positioned laterally to the arctic capsules shift to a ventral position. Now, miniaturization has been proposed as the key factor for the diversification above the species level and the evolution of major clays such as these amphibians. And that makes sense if we consider that these morphological novelties represent a new pool of morphologies for further diversification. Now, something that is also relevant is that miniaturized species uh, not only present these novel morphologies, but they also present, usually present, many pedomorphic traits. And when this is the case, we can infer that some sort of ontogenetic truncation was involved in the size reduction. And what I want to stress, and um, to stress that is important for this work, is that 
pedomorphosis should not be considered um, an outcome, a consequence of the novel morphology, of, sorry, of the size reduction, but related to the causes of the size reduction. So my objective here was to answer a couple of questions. The first one, do small bisorophoids present novel morphological arrangements? And if they do, could this arrangement be explained as consequence of the body size reduction? And on the other hand, um, I wanted to know, okay, do the small bisorophoids present pedomorphic traits? And by doing so, I wanted to explore whether on the genetic truncation was involved in the size reduction, and also I wanted to differentiate these pedomorphic traits from these traits potentially resulting from miniaturization, that, as I told, they are not the same. So regarding the first question, uh, do they present a novel morphology? When I refer to the smallest disorophoids, I refer to three species, Dolcerpeton, Amphibamus, and Apateum gracilis. These are the three smallest metamorphosed species. Then we have neotenic species, but this is something a bit different. Um, so we can see here, when compared to a larger Amphibamus, that actually they have a concerned morphology and the typical disposition of dermal bones of Ternospondos. Of course, they have a particular morphology, that's why we say that they are distinctive species. But how different are they from the rest of these orophoids? Are they outliers in the morphospace of the shapes of these orophoids? Well, to test that, um, I used geometric morphometric techniques. I digitized um, 19 lamas that represent the skull uh, morphology. Then I did a classical general progressive analysis, PCA, and I estimated the shapes of the ancestral states. Then I calculated the distances between each of these species, 34 species in total, to first the average shape of the clay and also to the um, shape of the last common ancestor. Then I ordered these distances, and as you can see here in both graphics, here is distance from the consensus, here from the last common ancestor. The three species are not among those species uh, in the more external parts of the morphospace. So, in other words, small body size species are not outliers respect to other dysrophoids. So, what about more subtle changes? Baby miniaturization is affecting uh, the skull in a more subtle way. So to test that, I used linear morphometrics. I took 22 variables of the skull roof and 14 of the palate of the same 34 species. And I defined these variables um, in a way to try to test whether um, some structures were affected by these constraints on nervous and sensory organs, such as in living amphibians. And also to test for previous statements on miniaturization in thermostones. So with these variables, what I did was to uh, calculate the evolutionary allometry of one of each of these variables. And what I was expecting under miniaturization was first that those structures under the, these new constraints of body size, I was expecting uh, to obtain a negative allometric pattern, meaning that in the smallest species, these structures uh, would be larger than in the larger um, um, species. And so I was expecting that the smallest forms to present positive residuals, very positive, positive residuals, meaning that the morphology, that the size reduction reached a minimum size for these structures. And also to be considered as a consequence of miniaturization, I wanted to test whether they were or not uh, related to pedomorphosis, because if they could be explained by pedomorphosis, pedomorphosis is a more parsimonious uh, explanation than miniaturization. So to test whether these variables, um, these structures, were pedomorphic, what I did was to use the same variables and I calculated the ontogenetic allometry that was before uh, evolutionary allometry, this is ontogenetic allometry, in this basal species of this orophoid, which is Microbiotic Perton Crenneri, and we have a good fossil record for this. This was, I chose this species. And under pedomorphosis, I expected the match between evolutionary allometric patterns and ontogenetic patterns. Now, the results. As I told you, when using the miniaturized Lys amphibians, as a model, I was expecting that the smallest forms of this orophoid presented huge eyes, proportionally large eyes, 
large brain cases and large optic capsules. So what did I get? Well, for the eyes, I actually got a negative allometric pattern for the orbit length, meaning that the smallest forms tend to have larger, proportionally larger orbits than the larger relatives. However, I got an isometric pattern for the interpterigoid vacuities, meaning that the muscles of the eyes uh, were not larger in the smallest species. And taking into account that actually the size of the orbit is not a good proxy for the size of the eye, we cannot say that they actually had larger eyes. eyes. What about the brain case? Well, I took three measurements as proxies of the brain case, because um, usually the brain case is not ossified or not well preserved enough. So regarding this measurement on the skull roof, I got a positive allometric pattern. But in the palette, I did recover the expected uh, negative allometric pattern. But the problem is that, well, not the problem, but I got the same pattern for the endogenetic level, meaning that this character, this trait, could be interpreted as pedomorphic. And also, small species, the three small species that I considered as miniature size, they did not depart from the general trend of the clade, meaning that the brain case was apparently not affected by miniaturization. What about the optic capsules? Well, I took this variable, these measurements in the basal plate, again, as a proxy of the optic capsules, and again, I got a negative, despected ne negative allometric pattern. However, again, I got the same pattern in my camera pattern, and again, the small species did not depart from the general trend of the clay. So, as a small conclusion from this part, we can say that the cranial morphology of the smallest stemnosphomus does not correlate with the radical null arrangements of the skull present in the extant miniature side amphibians. And this could be explained simply because uh, they had a different a differential resistance to constraints, but I think that it, the most parsimonious explanation is just that the size decrease in stemnosphomus was less severe than in these amphibians. And we have here, for comparison, the skull of the tiny amphibamus, and here of the uh, miniaturized salamander. So as we can see, the miniaturized salamander, with all these changes that I talked about, is at least four times smaller than the smallest uh, disorophoid. Another interesting result that uh, I got from the linear analysis is that more than a half of the variables show the same pattern at the evolutionary and the genetic level, suggesting that these variables, that these uh, traits, were pedomorphic, and suggesting also that the size decrease, uh, that the ontogenetic truncation was somehow involved in the size decrease, and that pedomorphosis was an important phenomenon for the evolution of the clay. So to explore a bit further this uh, pedomorphosis hypothesis, just, and it was just exploratory, I'm trying to work a bit more on this. Uh, what I wanted to do is to compare the changes between the small disorophoids in comparison to the last common ancestor of these disorophoids and compare them to the changes that suffers uh, one species of, of thermospondyls called sclerocephalus in the ontogeny. I chose sclerocephalus because of the um, of the fossil record. Unfortunately, I couldn't do that in my camel herpeton. Sclerocephalus is not a disorophoid, but it was the, the best option that I had. So what I did was to use uh, 11 landmarks to represent the uh, skull roof. I did again the GPA, um, a general progressive analysis, a PCA. Um, and I plot the difference in shapes between the, well, this is not that clear, but trust me. Uh, this represents the shape difference between the larger sclerocephalus and the smallest specimens. And here, the shape big difference between the last common ancestor of these arophoids and the small species. So maybe it's not that clear, but as you can see, in the smallest species, specimens of sclerocephalus, we have a, a short snout a wide orbit and also a wide um, skull roof. And the same changes happen in uh, the small species. And this is a support, uh, an extra support for the pedomorphosis hypothesis of the evolution of the small forms. So as a conclusion, first, the reduction in body size in these might have not 
uh, reached the threshold at which the extrapolation of evolutionary allometries and minimum functional sizes may result in novel morphological arrangements. And finally, it seems that the truncation of the ancestral ontogeny and not miniaturization was the factor that played a major role in the morphological evolution of small viscerophoids. So, acknowledgments to my advisors, to the um, uh, creator of the collections I visited, and happy. <laughs> Thank you very much.